Thank you, Julia. And it's a real pleasure to be here this morning. As you heard, uh, we like to accelerate economic growth by funding and connecting business-led innovation. And Chris has asked me today to cast the net a bit wider and talk about some of the things we're doing right across the economy, which is a bit of a challenge uh, in 10 minutes, but we'll give it a go. Now, I'm very conscious that we're sitting in a room filled with people that are working at probably at the highest productivity levels in the UK. And that's no surprise. You invest heavily in R&D. You sit in this competitive engineering structure. Uh, and that creates an atmosphere, a culture which we've heard about for change. But you are not typical in the United Kingdom by a long shot. And if we look at comparisons of productivity across the G7, the USA, France, Germany managed to be above the average productivity. UK sadly is not. Uh, and Italy, Canada have come down to join us. And Japan has yet to reach that level. So productivity is a really important point. As the economist Paul Krugman said, productivity isn't everything, but in the long run, it is almost everything because it determines prosperity. And without prosperity, you don't have the luxury of choices and the money to invest and move on and do things. And if you look to the Bank of England for some guidance as to what's gone wrong with productivity, this is from a speech given by Andy Haldane, their chief econom economist, and it shows dramatically the kind of difference that's there. You are in that purple line. You are part of a frontier economy in the language of economists, together with pharmaceuticals, aerospace, auto, R&D intensive industries that have a surging track record of productivity. And the UK is very, very proud of that. The green line, right down at the bottom, is where the rest of the UK economy averages out. And you can see that when you put the two together, you are simply not big enough to drive the UK economy upwards. So we end up with that very flat blue line that's just above the low productivity component. So that's a really important challenge. And in thinking about that, I just wanted to talk about two things in my 10 minutes, if I could fit them both in. One of which is Innovate UK and yourselves sit very much in this frontier economy. We love working with those that are the innovators. We love working with those that are the early adopters. But 84% of the United Kingdom economy sits on the other side of that chasm where the culture is different. And I think it's worth spending a little bit of time on that later in the talk because if you want to grow, if you want to grow bigger than the frontier economy, you're going to encounter the rest of the United Kingdom economy and you need a few tricks up your sleeve to work out how to do that. So what I'd like to do is spend a bit of time on what's happening in Innovate UK on that frontier and give you some exciting new areas that the government is investing heavily and substantially in over the next four years, give you some thinking around what we're doing in going global, and some new opportunities to do collaborative work around the world. Uh, and then let's spend a little bit of time very quickly thinking about diffusion and the challenges of reaching the broader economy. So what's happening on the frontier? Well, it's really exciting because the government has decided, despite the difficult times, to invest 4.7 billion over the next four years in research and innovation. And it's going to do that in a number of different ways. One of the most significant is it set up an industrial strategy challenge fund. And it's already announced the first six big areas that it's going to be investing in. And if you're thinking about areas where the government is gonna step up and put in a significant incentive for research and business to work together to crack exciting markets of the future, you will find a lot of opportunity in these spaces. Medicines manufacturing, so this is focusing on new types of medicines, precision medicines, medicines made from cell and gene therapies, not your standard blockbusters. A completely different way of manufacturing is required. There will be about 200 million pounds spent on that over the next four years in research and innovation. Robotics for hazardous environments, there will be about 100 million put into the area working out how can you make things safer for people to work in mines, to work in oceans, to work in nuclear industries. We're good at robotics. There's a really big opportunity there and it's focused in on the area of hazardous environments. Very important to yourselves, and we've heard from the activities of McLaren, batteries for clean and flexible energy storage. That's the biggest one. 250 million pounds will go into research and innovation in that space driving the community to come up with really good solutions. Why? 50% of the value of a car, as you well know, in the future, if it's electric, 
will be in the batteries. If we're not making batteries, if we're not the forefront of batteries, we're in a difficult situation when it comes to auto manufacturing in the future. There will be about 40 million going into self-driving vehicles, as we've heard, a really exciting and important topic with lots of interesting companies here in the UK. And there's about 30 million going into manufacturing and materials for the future, particularly focusing on lightweighting, an area where you guys are superbly skilled, both for aerospace and automotive, and the challenges of that. And there's a large facility costing about 100 million pounds that's going into uh, Oxfordshire to look at testing satellites and space. We are also world leaders in that industry, whether it's the big ones from, uh, that are made or the new generation of nano uh, satellites that are coming to being. Just to point out in the short time a couple of key differences. This is the government really wanting to leverage the research base. So there is a very strong focus on Innovate UK, together with the research councils, working together to put the collaborations in place that will draw on the research base. Why? That creates really good advantage. If you can put really novel research in, our own evidence shows you will achieve more economic impact in the longer run. And we invest a lot in science, and it's good to tie it in. The other thing that will be interesting to see how it works out, we're taking the DARPA style of leadership for these challenges. So there will be challenge directors. You may well have seen the adverts already put out that will actually lead these projects and actually have more power and capability to drive that forward. So let's move on to going global. So many of you will be involved in Horizon 2020. There's some excellent activities going there. It's alive and well is probably my biggest message. Yes, we're heading towards Brexit, but UK businesses are winning funding from Horizon 2020 on a good scale. It is more difficult to put together some of the collaborations, but companies participating are winning. Please do that. Areas you might not have heard about would be the Newton Fund. This actually goes out and invests in all kinds of different countries around the world. It is part of the government's official development assistance, so it is targeted on issues that are important to the destination country. But many businesses use this as a really interesting way to get into global activities. Eurostars. This may be a program you've never heard of, but it's actually designed for small businesses that are R&D intensive. If you are an R&D intensive small business and you want to collaborate with one of the 45 countries in Eureka, the Eurostars program allows you to put in submissions for you and a collaborative company in another part of the world to work on a project together. You have to be R&D intensive. This is designed for you almost uh, in, in a way to reach out and go to the rest of the world. We've also now run our first two competitions uh, in linking with China, and you'll see us work to try and build the same arrangements with other countries around the world. This is with Shanghai and Jiangsu, and the competition is now closed, but we've had a substantially good response to this, and this is genuinely collaborative R&D. This is not a request to go and make something in China or for somebody to come and borrow your intellectual property. These are projects that are genuinely looking for collaborative R&D between China and the UK. So if you want to get involved in this kind of project, this is one where it's not governed by official development assistance. Both sides are there for the commercial gain that they can achieve. So we have one thing a little bit in common with yourselves in that we design race courses, and I thought I'd better change the picture. I usually have horses, but I'll, I'll switch to motor cars. But just to give you a feel for some of the things that we've done differently more recently, which could be of interest, we spent more time encouraging people to do design. You'll all understand design, but we have a world-class design industry in the UK, and not enough people use it. Too many people come with their technology, they don't actually explore the problem, and therefore the value that they're creating before they go into the technology phase. And we spend a lot more time working now with investors. And if you've noticed, we've also run our very first competition simultaneously with the venture capital community. It's called the uh, Investment Accelerator. Go take a look at it. It actually offers 100% funding. Grant funding to the normal limit. The VC provides the match funding. And this has got, again, a phenomenal number of applications and I think it's a really interesting way forward for Innovate UK to work more closely with investors. You've heard about working with the sector programs. I've told you about the challenging programs, these industrial uh, strategy challenge fund. And yes, for the APC, we, we run their programs for them. So we're a delivery partner for the APC. And it's good to see them and the Warwick Manufacturing Group here today working with you. So let's just finish a little bit on this diffusion challenge because I want to get you thinking a little bit about this so that you are pushing beyond your boundaries and perhaps thinking how to do it. 
The double diamond, that picture there, is the Design Council's view of how people should be thinking about design. Spending time thinking about the problem and all the different ways of addressing it, working out where the value is before you start working out the engineering. And then spending time on all the different ways of solving the engineering challenge to come out with the best solution. And you'll all be familiar with that, and you'll also be very familiar that that is not a linear journey. It's not a smooth flow from left to right. And you'll be mainly concerned about that in the piece that you work in. But actually, let's just moment, spend a moment thinking about what happens <laughs> after you've made it. Because if the system sends out an immune response and actually rejects the innovation, you don't get scale. You don't get volume of deployment. You come up with a brilliant solution, but it doesn't actually grow and scale in the system that you've put it into. That's because the system is full of politics. The system is full of power plays. The system is full of regulations. And whilst on a racetrack, that might be greatly simplified. In the rest of the economy, it's not. So trying to understand more about how to tackle those, there's a very good book called The Immune Response. Uh, I recommend people have a read of that. It's very interesting to think about how do you tackle that. And actually, you end up coming back to the kind of entrepreneurial attitude to get around the problem. But not now a technical problem, not now an engineering problem, but how do you actually get around the problems that are occurring inside big organizations like the NHS, inside electricity companies, inside areas that you might want to venture into, it's worth thinking about because it's no point in just delivering a superb prototype. You want scale and volume to come out of that. And whilst you live in a world of almost continuous prototyping, the rest of the economy is a little bit more settled than that. So I think in just finishing and wrapping up, uh, what I'd like to think about then is just this world about understanding the wider system that you're working in. You're engineers, you understand systems, but don't just limit your thinking to the system that you're working on as an engineering problem. Think of the entire context in which it sits. Think about that in the context of design. And then very importantly, think about that in the context of how you get something to scale if you're working outside of your own traditional motorsport area. Thank you very much. I look forward to joining the panel later. <laughs>